right. It is six o'clock on Monday, July 19th. I will call to order the Winooski City Council Board of Health meeting. Um, please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance, led by Deputy Mayor Hal Colston. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You're welcome. So we have one item on tonight's agenda, um, investigation of a domestic vicious pet incident. Um, Chief Audi, uh, do you have an introduction for this? I think I need to bring some guests over. Yeah, so, um, you know, under our ordinance, you are the Board of Health who, um, who would do this hearing. Um, the victim did request a hearing. Um, our animal control um, officer, Stephanie Jingris, um, is here. Um, and I believe the, the victim's here. I don't know if we heard from the pet owner today or if he's in the list. Um, and essentially, you know, you're going to, I sent you the packet, you will hear from the animal control officer, the victim, the pet owner. And then in chapter three, you'll review, I believe it's A through E, and see what's applicable. Um, and you can take no action or you can take action as allowable within, within the ordinance. Um, upon your determination, we will then draft a, a order for um, whoever you authorize to sign such order. Thank you, Chief. Um, Stephanie, welcome. If you would like to first give us a summary of the incident and, and your recommendations. Yes, definitely. Um, so in your packet, you should have um, my report that I had written up and signed for you guys, um, but I'll kind of summarize that for you. Um, so I apologize. Give me one second so I can kind of, sure. so when it was, so the 18th, at um, roughly 07.53 a.m., Miss um, Brosu, Heidi, came in to the station after being attacked by a dog on the walking path near the Woolen Mill, the Winooski Falls Dam near the Woolen Mill. Um, she spoke with Lieutenant um, Heisinga. Um, I was not in the office, so she spoke with him and gave her report Later that morning, I spoke with Heidi to get um, information about the incident and also spoke with the dog owner. Um, Heidi was walking down the path, saw the dog and the owner, gave a wide berth to go around them. The owner was bent over, presumably picking up um, feces, which the dog owner did confirm that's what he was doing. Um, when Heidi went around the dog, the dog lunged at her the way she and bit her, I believe knocked her down. Heidi can correct me on that when she speaks, um, but knocked her down as well. Bit her in the, in the rib cage on the right side. There are photos included in your packet, photos that were, there's a photo taken that morning by the, by the Lieutenant who's Heisinga, I apologize, um, as well as pictures that Heidi provided um, afterwards. Um, Heidi described um, the incident as um, similar to videos that you see of police canine dogs when they, you know, rah, 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 and go, um, kind of go, sorry, <laughs> then my little, and they kind of go at, you know, at something that they're intended to. Um, so that's how she had described it to me. I spoke with, um, I want to make sure I apologize. There's, um, William and Alexandru um, are the owners of the dog, um, and they their husband, you know, a married couple, and they have they have two different last names. So Mr. Landry William was the one who was with the dog, walking him when this happened. Um, so I did speak with him, and um, he described the incident as the um, you know he was he was attempting to pick up poop, and um, the dog, you know, lunged at her. Um, he wasn't quite sure, you know, he wasn't able to see what happened. He believed that um, Miss Brosu did not give enough space for the dog and had come into the dog's space, which startled him. Um, we were unable, we have no prior history 
with the dog. The dog's um, name is Remy, an eight-year-old Anatolian Shepherd mix. We have no prior history with them. The They recently moved up here from Texas. Um, Mr. Landry and his husband, last name is Alex, first name is Alex, his last name is escaping me, I'm sorry. Um, we were unable to locate his rabies vaccination. Um, Remy has since been vaccinated against rabies. He was quarantined for 10 days and was required to wear a muzzle at all times. Um, they have gotten, they got that mu when he was outside of the home, when he was outside, he had to be wearing a muzzle. Um, I checked on the fit of that muzzle. Um, it fits him well. He did really well wearing the muzzle. Um, and he was healthy at the end of the required 10 day quarantine. And after the quarantine, he was able to get vaccinated and he got vaccinated at Mountain View Animal Hospital in Essex. Um, I apologize that his last name is escaping me. I'm trying to find it here in my notes. I really do apologize. But um, Alex had Mr. Walker, Walker's his last name, I apologize, you know, expressed that, um, you know, continuing to use the muzzle because it made him more comfortable while having Remy outside, um, as well as the dog didn't seem to have issues with wearing a muzzle. Um, the muzzle that I requested that they get is what's called a basket muzzle. Um, there's different types of muzzles. You have the cloth muzzles that are literally just a piece of fabric, kind of a heavier duty cloth that goes just around their nose where the basket muzzle is literally that, a kind of a basket over their muzzle, um, which prevents them from biting, period. Where with a fabric muzzle, they can still kind of nip. They can open their mouth a little bit. Um, so they did get that muzzle. Mr. Walker advised that he intends to continue to use it. Um, I also, my recommendation would be the continued use of a muzzle. And the requirement, which is also required by the city, is that the dog always be on a leash, um, you know, be leashed at all times, which is required um, in the city of Winooski anyway. But that would definitely be my, my suggestion, is that he wear a basket muzzle. And I say specifically a basket muzzle because it prevents the dog from biting completely. But it, while it also allows him to pant and, you know, breathe normally, as um, well as drink water, you know, stick some treats in through the small holes and stuff. You can stick beef sticks in there. So um, it's a lot safer of a muzzle to use. Um, and based off prior history, I just, that would be my recommendation. Thank you for that. Heidi, is there anything you would like to add about your, your account of events? Oh, you'll have to go off mute. Okay, so um, thank you guys for having this meeting. I really do appreciate it very much. Um, nothing like this has ever happened to me before. I grew up with dogs. Um, the, I did want to correct, uh, I did take pictures of the area uh, where I was coming around. I was nowhere near the dog. I was across the path. Um, I don't know if the pictures are going to show up or not. But that shows the path right there. And I was approximately here. And the dog was up on the hill. So the dog came across the path to me. I was walking. Um, and I didn't have time to run. All I had time to do was turn quickly to the side. Um, it was not just a bite uh, where he was protecting or he felt threatened. This was the side of my body. Uh, the picture that the policeman took at the time, uh, you couldn't see because I had on a sports uh, bra that came down here, so you only saw the bottom. When I got home and took it off because I couldn't understand why I was in so much pain is when I saw all the rest of the bite that had happened. I was in pain for more than, you know what I mean? up until like the last few days and I still have marks. Um, the dog viciously came after me. Um, the, the fact that the dog was on a leash and broke from the owner 
uh, made it even more so aggressive if, you know, with the owner having it. If the, uh, one thing that does bother me when I walk down, I see people with dogs without leashes all the time. So I'm completely aware of dogs and I stop and I walk slower or I get as far away as I possibly can. So I don't uh, get in the, the area of the dog. I want the dog to know that I'm coming around. We see each other and I walk more slowly. Um, this was shocking to me. Um, I appreciate Stephanie was wonderful um, talking to me, telling me about the muzzle. Um, I was confused. I didn't know what to do. The thing that bothered me and uh, the thing that concerns me is that after all of this happened, I was screaming. So the dog knocked me down. He came across, knocked me down, and then bit me on the side. So, um, and I was screaming at a girl. I had the girl's name that came out from the apartment from all of it. But after all of this happened, and I didn't know what to do, and uh, as I was walking up the hill, there was a man and his child, two children walking down toward on the, the bike path. And this gentleman, after all of this happened, continued walking his dog. He didn't go straight home after his dog just attacked me like that. He continued walking his dog on the, the path because he pointed, oh, I live up here like that. And he continued to walk. And that's when I knew I had to report it. I mean, I just um, and the and the man and his child, I told him I was just attacked by this dog and the guy is still out walking his dog. And so they turned around and went back. And so my concern here, well, I do appreciate the muzzle and I, I, I'm here today to do everything I possibly can to protect anybody else that's out there. Um, I now carry mace and I have a small bat that I carry with me because when that dog knocked me down like that and when that pain came in and bit me, I didn't know if I was going to live through it um, and I didn't know how to get it off of me. And so I now, the fear of that of not being able to stop it, uh, the owner was able to stop the dog, but I've seen dogs bite. Um, I've had a dog that would bite if you went down towards it. The dog didn't just bite. He was, he was, he was coming after me. Um, and so uh, you know, even when I videoed the owner and said, well, I, I got to get your name, your information. And he was saying, well, she was running past me and she got in his space. And I knew right then it's like this, this version of this story is going to be like this dog who would normally, if you come quickly in front of a dog and you surprise it, it's going to, you know, go to protect. I was not running. I had slowed my walk as I was coming around. I gave it lots of space and, um, and the dog didn't scratch me. The dog went after me. So I really don't, I, I put in my letter that I am the kind of person that says, oh, I'm okay, don't worry, it's gonna be all right. I know dogs, da da da. But you know, I'm here today to protect the next person that this dog could possibly do this to. I had on a thick, fleece jacket because it was cold and the uh damage that that dog did to the my side if I had not had that on if I had just had on a regular t-shirt if I had been a kid um if I hadn't turned quickly to the right would that have been my throat or my face that that dog would have gone after um like I said I am a big dog person I do not think this dog should be allowed on a bike path. It should not be allowed in a public area. They want to let their dog out in the backyard and walk it around with the leash. That is the only place I think this dog needs to be anywhere in public that the next person might not be as lucky as me. So while I appreciate the, the use of a cage uh, muzzle for the dog, this dog should I, I worry every time I walk down there now that, that I'm going to see that dog out there. I, my heart just races as I'm coming around that area every single time that that person is going to be there with that dog again. Um, and will I get my mace out fast enough? So um, anyway, that's, I, I just, 
I cannot say this strong enough. I do not feel like this dog should be allowed in a public area. Um, I was lucky. The next person might not be that lucky. Thank you. Well, thank you for reporting it, Heidi, um, and attending the meeting tonight to share your story. I don't know, those photos look very aggressive. Um, so council, per our ordinance, we can direct this owner to dispose of their pet, muzzle it, chain it, or confine it. Um, those are the options here in the ordinance. Um, we could have staff send this directive to the owners and, you know, should they have the dog in public space in Winooski, not complying with whatever order we set forth, they, there would be penalties for them. Um, you know, we've heard from our health officer a recommendation to have the dog muzzled. Uh, and we've heard from the victim a recommendation to confine the dog essentially and not allow it on our public spaces. And so I think those are the kind of, that's the choice that we need to make this evening. So I would ask if anyone has thoughts there or if you have additional questions for um, Heidi or for staff. Bryn. Yeah, thanks. Um, I just want to say I'm so sorry to hear about this incident. Um, and uh, definitely can feel for you. Uh, it's got to be pretty scary. I'm curious um, if Chief Audi or, or um, uh, Officer Jingers can say if there's any precedent um, for something that similar that's happened in the past of how it's been managed by the um, by the council. So quite often. Um, the first step for a first bite, um, typically that's been, you know, my recommendation and kind of the subsequent um, thought of the council is, um, you know, is muzzling and requiring the leash. Um, I also work for Colchester, so they don't require a leash. So I, I've done council meetings for both. Um, and so that's also something that they requires the dog be leashed. Um, I have had a dog that was, um, that did not reside in Colchester, but was visiting, um, family. And, um, I believe, I don't want to say hundred percent, but 99% as I'm remembering clearly is that they, um, they requested that the dog not be allowed to back. Um, the dog could not come back to that neighborhood. Um, was what they ended up doing. Um, it really can, it varies on severity of, um, of the incident, the number of bites, um, things of that nature. So, um, you know, typically for the first bite, that usually is my recommendation. If it had, you know, and of course, that would all, my recommendation would also vary depending on, um, you know, the severity. Yes, the injury was severe and traumatizing. I definitely don't want to downplay that whatsoever um, because it definitely was. Does that answer your question? It does. If I'm allowed another follow-up, Mayor. Sure. Um, it sounds like they, based off of the report, um, that there were no tags on the dog and, and that up until um, you got actual vaccination that there wasn't any vaccination before that. Was there any fine or I mean it doesn't sound like the dog was registered in the city you know has there been any additional follow-up on those elements he has been vaccinated since he was I ensured that he was vaccinated that there you know he went there was an appointment that the appointment was made and that he went um at the end of the 10-day quarantine because they cannot be vaxxed if they're expired or anything like that and they need to get updated they're not they cannot be updated during those 10 days. So he was updated on that 10th day. Um, yeah, I think my question really was- so no, I, there, Sorry. Has there been any um, penalty issued for not being registered in Winooski or not wearing dog tags? I mean, there's other elements in this ordinance that I'm thinking about. I did not know. Okay. I don't believe this person resides in Winooski. He, uh, no. I was just going to say, I think the dog 
frequents two different addresses, one in Colchester, one in Winooski. Okay. Um, the, the owners have two different addresses. No, they live in, um, they live on Main Street. The addresses that we have in the system for them are actually, one of them is Grand Isle, and I can't remember the, one, the other one, um, but they recently, when they moved back to Vermont, at least from my conversations with um, Alex, Mr. Walker, um, they, you know, recently moved back um, and they're living um, on Main Street, Lower Main Street. Yes, Lower Main Street. So yes, they are Winooski residents. And no, I did not issue a fine in regards to the dog not being vaccinated. Hal. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I have a question for you, Heidi. And I, I'm really sorry you had to um, suffer from this traumatic experience. Um, just a, a, a clarifying question. How many different bites did you experience? I don't know. <laughs> wow. I felt, I felt a, like, like, like a bear clamp on my side. And that's when I screamed out because of the pain of coming that. And I was just dizzy. I remember thinking, I, how do I get this dog off of me? I, I don't know how to get it off of me. But what, what I showed looks is the bite circle. So I don't know if I'm getting that close enough to see, but you can see where the incisors or the sharp teeth are. And you can see the to top two and the sides and the bottom. That's how big his mouth was open to come across. And I appreciate the, the, the one bite rule, but I, this, I, I think that using the word bite is minimizing. Um, this was an attack. The dog came across, knocked me down, and attacked me. And so, I, like I said, I have a dog that would bite, um, and I kept her in the house. Um, so I don't know, um, but I, I, I just, I felt the one great big uh, pain of when it, when it happened. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Mike? Yes. Hi, Heidi. I'm sorry that this happened on our bike path. Um, but Heidi's right. What happens if this was a child? This would have been a real bad situation because it could have easily have really hurt a child. At least Heidi's strong enough to be able to move. Um, and I think it's irresponsible of the owners not to be here tonight. I think it's irresponsible of the owners not to register their dog or have the tags on the dog. And I'm kind of questioning why there isn't a fine in place for these owners now that the dog has bitten somebody. I also want to make a suggestion that the dog definitely has to be muzzled in public spaces, but I think it needs to be confined to its own yard for a probational period until the dog can get used to the muzzle and see if the muzzle will even work. Cause I don't know if the muzzles can get knocked off with the dog's claws. Um, but being the first incident, and this is a pretty violent incident, I'm not sure if I'm ready to make a recommendation of terminating the dog's life, but I think it should be definitely muzzled and confined to the home for a, a probational period. And we revisit this because it definitely shouldn't be at any parks or any children. Um, and I think the owners need to take some ownership of what happened. Can I make a statement? Sure. The, the young man and his two children, they have one in the stroller and the toddler walking behind him minutes, you know, after I, we had done, and uh, we probably stood there around 15, 10, what, I don't even know how much time before I started walking away, and they were walking down on that same path. If that would have been them, um, it would have, you know, where they had been too close, I was not intimidating to this dog at all. And the again, too, for me to turn, when I turn like that and that dog did that, it could have been my throat or my face. And I understand the one bite rule and I don't want to terminate any dog's life. I love dogs. I struggle with this, 
but not at the expense of what the next time is going to be. Um, uh, again, I've been around dogs all my life and this, this was just bizarre uh, the way. And like I said, when I saw those kids, that just immediately went to me as I can't just say, oh, I'm okay, I'll be all right. Um, and, and, you know, the, Mr. Myers, you're right with the irresponsibility. They didn't show up today. Um, the, the fact that that guy kept walking on the path with the dog right after that happened, I would have gone home and been scared to death of what just happened with my dog. And, but he, he kept walking the dog. I was like, I don't even get that. Um, so, so and I, I do want to say, Stephanie, thank you so much. Um, I was lost after this all happened and talking to you for all that time and, and, and listening to me and, and giving me the guidance that you did. Um, I have been so impressed with, with the police when I went up uh, and reported the incident with Stephanie immediately getting in contact with me with this meeting today. Um, I appreciate uh, everything that you guys are doing here. And I feel, I, have the, I feel very heard. And that's all I want to do is that it's taken off of my shoulders and I'm putting it on your shoulders. Um, I've done everything that I can. And so any next incident is not on me. Thanks, Heidi. Mike? Yeah, I have a follow-up on if, if we do confine the dog to the property's owner, how is that regulated? And it, I mean... <laughs> I think if it is found out and about, they would be penalized again. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think the qu uh, question here for staff then, it sounds like there is some interest in a period of confinement followed by permanent muzzle order as well as penalty for not being licensed. Is that within our purview? What, um, what do folks think the confinement period should be? My uh, initial thought is like 90 days go through the summer period when we will have the most children out and about. Brynn, I saw you unmuted. Yeah, I, I mean, this is a really serious uh, incident. Um, I, I mean, I'm almost um, opposed to having it be anything less than permanent. Um, I would be concerned about um, the dog being out, um, having even, you know, I, I agree with Councillor Myers to some extent, worry about the consistency of wearing the muzzle, if the muzzle comes loose. Um, I mean, it, it, we really are fortunate that it wasn't more serious. Um, I, do, I do agree that there should be a penalty. I'm okay if, um, the confinement is for a designated period of time, but I do think the muzzle should be permanent and there should be a fine. Thanks, Hal. I, I agree. And, and I'm really concerned that the owner is not here, as Councillor Myers pointed out. That just, I mean, that's, I mean, I, if, even if we were to impose a, a permanent confinement, I, I'd go along with that. I just think this is horrible. And it should should send a strong message to the to the community that you better keep your dogs under your control. Thanks, Stephanie. Sorry, um, I just want to address the issue. So I have I verified that the muzzle. I've seen the dog on the muzzle um, on a couple different occasions. Um, I had seen the dog, and he actually, um, you know. I was very impressed because usually they're pulling to try and get it off or having a hard time adjusting to it. And the muzzle is actually a really good fit for the dog. So I did verify they had everything prop on properly. It was fitted properly. Um, so yes, I, I, I understand. And you know, whatever you guys 
feel. I just want you to know that I have, you know, I did check it and things can't always happen, but I just want you to know that I have checked it. It is an appropriate fit. He actually, like most dogs, I was shocked because usually they're trying to get it off the whole time and everything. And, you know, um, when I did meet and see the dog with the muzzle on, on three occasions, he didn't paw it at once, um, didn't try and shake his head, any of that kind of normal wanting to get not being used to a muzzle. Um, so just so you guys are aware of that piece. Yes, there's all kinds of other circumstances, but I have seen it. So just so you have that piece. Thank you. Mike? Yeah. Um, I, th I think if we do the confinement, it, it shows it sends a message to the owner of how serious we're taking this. So it's kind of like a probation period on him. Um, and, you know, I, <laughs> I just thought, forgot what I was going to say. So let me gather my thoughts again and come back to me, okay? Well, I, um, I would lean towards a temporary term of confinement with the suggestion that these folks get training for their dog um, and have a second chance, but understand also the feelings about the serious nature. Um, Jim, I saw your hand. Yes, thank you. And I, I'll just add on, Heidi, I'm so sorry that this has happened to you. And as a parent of two small kids, I very much immediately thought of that situation and being lucky that to some extent that it was you, not them. And I hate that, that you had to face that and take that for another family. But um, so thank you for doing what you're doing here by bringing this issue forward. Um, I support a muzzle um, requirement and a probationary period, I too was thinking three months as an initial start, um, because I think that gives also time to ensure that these owners are going to be responsible in following that order. And I think if there's any, um, to me, I would see any violation of this order, even once with no incident, just saying, hey, we found this person walking their dog without a muzzle or walking their dog at all during the confinement period as a sign that this these owners can't be trusted to um, have this dog. So that would be a pretty serious next step I think that we should take. I would also encourage us to notify um, the town of Grand Isle that this has happened um, so that they're aware that this dog that apparently may have two addresses is um, that they are aware of the situation as well. Thanks. Chief Audi? Uh, from a practical standpoint, um, knowing the address where they reside in Winooski um, for council to um, with the interest of confinement. Um, that is a property they are using public space um, because there's no yard with that property. So as you talk about confinement, um, there's, there's, no, there's not an option. So as you take action, I just ask that you give um, city staff, the ACO and myself, you know, the, the leeway to understand um, how they can confine the in the animal, and if it's not acceptable to us, then we need we need to be able to come back to you because um, th there's just there's not a yard at the property at 22 Main. Um, they're using the public park because that's their yard. Um, so I just not to complicate things any further than it is. But. That is a challenge, Mike. Yeah, that <laughs> got my train thought, and Chief. Chief Audi must have heard my brain talking because I wanted to know what the address was because I didn't see it in the report or missed it. And that was my next question is, did, do they have their own space to walk the dog? Um, so now we have a, a bigger problem, I think. Heidi? I don't know how to do the, the hand thing, so I apologize. <laughs> I'm doing it old school. Um, so I did like your idea, I think, is it Christine, the way you yeah. name, of showing that the dog went through some kind of training, uh, that if it was going to come back, if you guys are doing a probationary, that it would attend some kind of training. Uh, one of my clients has a, a dog that is going through training right now because it goes after other dogs. But, and I do respectfully understand that 22 Main Street does not have their own yard, but I'm sure he has a car and he can drive to Grand Isle or he can drive somewhere that it's not on the bike path to where it's not at least where people are walking every morning. But I understand, I'm, um, 
I don't know what to do either, but I, you said something about training for the dog. I, I think that, um, I thought, I, I think you'd said it just in passing, but I, I really like that as far as, um, I just wanted to say I like that. So thanks. I don't, I mean, is that within our power to order? It's not explicit in the ordinance. Well, John, do you have thoughts there? We have the power to terminate it, don't we? Can, can you say that again, Mayor? Sorry. Do we actually have the authority to say your dog is confined until you have completed, can show us it's completed some kind of behavior training? Yeah, you can put any conditions. Um, you, know, you could say the dog can't reside in Winooski. Um, yeah. Um, the, the problem I have with some of the conditions is it then puts it on staff, and that's tough, right? I mean, that's um, saying it can be in a public space lesser than the, the bike path. Uh, that's, you know, you were all saying the owners aren't responsible enough to be here tonight. Are they responsible enough to stay in a space that who's going to determine that safe is that space is, is a better space than the bike path. And that just puts a lot of liability on, on staff and a lot of, you know, there, it just, it's an awkward position to be in. Yeah, I mean, I, so I think part of your recommendation to muzzle is because that is the most viable solution we have here, unfortunately. Um, we can't, I don't think we can order confinement the dog has to go outside to go to the bathroom. Um, I am not inclined to have it disposed of. And I also am not inclined to, on a first incident, while it is a very serious one, say that they have to either get rid of their dog or move, essentially. I think that is the tough corner that we're in. Mike? I like the training idea. Why don't we impose a, a uh, condition that they need to go through a training with their dog on the muzzle and see how the dog goes through the training. If the dog can't pass the training, then there's only a few options, and that's the dog not residing in Winooski, the people not residing in Winooski, or the dog's life ends. I mean, it's just simple as that. Because if this, have a, this would be a different conversation if it broke her arm or really seriously bit her face and really put her in the hospital. I mean, imagine my 10 year old daughter. It, it, it's just, it's unacceptable. So it's a tough, it's a tough deal, but I think we're the people that have to protect or not protect, but we have to ensure that our policies protect all our residents here, small and big. So I think we could say permanent muzzle. Um, we want a fine for the lack of license and we want proof of training, proof of behavioral training completion, or we will consider further action. Hell. And, and Mayor, I, I would even ask us to consider that we have a check-in with the owner at, at, a, at a future date and understand how this all played out as far as the training, but have the owner really um, be held accountable. So, Jim? And could I, um, could I suggest that we at least attempt to limit the area of Winooski that this dog is allowed to be in since confinement to the home and yard is not an option. I mean, I would hate to see this dog at Landry Park or in Cassavant or in other public spaces where there could be children separated from parents on a trail. Like I don't, I, I hear that point. I'm glad that it's been made that we can't utilize the home space for this, but um, is there, is it possible to restrict to a certain area so this dog is observed outside that area that, that is notified? So I, I would counter that I see unaccompanied children on every sidewalk in this town um, and that a, perhaps, I don't know what that property looks like. Perhaps a restriction is like you could take this dog out to use the bathroom in the immediate vicinity of your building, but you cannot extend beyond the property. 
is that um, is staff familiar with the property to say if that's viable or not? Stephanie? Um, I'm not sure if um, John would know working, you know, being in zoning. So it's kind of a question direct to him is I'm not sure who owns that little grassy area to the left of 22 Main. Maybe that is even an area that I don't know where that, who that belongs to, but maybe that's even an appropriate area to restrict it to is that grassy area. I don't know if anybody knows what I'm talking, which area I'm talking about, but I don't know what that like property address is or whatever, if that's part of 22 Main and maybe the dog just can't leave 22 Main. Um, that might be a nice, it's right there by the apartment and it's a good, a decent sized little grassy spot for the dog to be able to go. Um, I'm just not, I don't know logistically, like what do we call that? What, you know, what the address is, that stuff. Does staff know the answer to that? I believe that's Winooski Falls Park. Stephanie that's Park. the area she's referring to? Yeah. I think, I don't know. Do y'all think that we could say like you can only, you can only, this dog can only be in Winooski Falls Park for this duration. You need to come back with us and prove that you have completed behavioral training before that ends. And then there's also this muzzle order. Mike? I have another concern about the dog being confined to a small space is its uh, anxiety to be able to get exercise and, you know, get his blood pump in. So I don't know how this is going to work trying to get the owners responsible, but they could just probably tell us no and just take their dog to Burlington's dog park or some other dog park. How do, how can we, fix this situation and are we going to be able to do this tonight because John. yeah so I, mike i think a little bit along your lines is with your emotion i would suggest that you put some very strict timelines on on stuff the dog's muzzled um if that's what you so choose anytime it's it's outdoors um it's confined to that park um, the owners need to make one of your August council meetings and in 60 days, they need to be um, at least enrolled or through a, you know, dog aggression type class um, acceptable to our animal control officer. I think that covers quite a bit. It, it gives us a timeline, um, holds them accountable, um, limits our, our, the city's um, liability, in my opinion. Um, and if they miss those steps, you know, if they miss the August meetings, we're coming back to you to, to have a different conversation. Okay. That sounds good. I like that. Stephanie, you want to add something? Sorry, I keep having trouble with that mute button. Um, I just wanted to point out that with my conversations with um, Mr. Walker, they have, they are trying to, um, they are actively looking for house um, and are actively looking to move outside of Winooski. This has always been kind of a temporary move before they could um, find something. Um, you know, with well, they moved in here um, last year. And so with, you know, the pandemic and everything. So um, they did look at a property, a home in, um, in Waterbury. Um, so they are intending to move. Yes, that's could happen, could not happen, we don't know, but that is something that they spoke with me about actively doing, is looking for um, a home home, a house. So this might not be, for, Winooski is not intended to be their permanent residence. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, so does someone wanna make a motion to permanently muzzle the dog outdoors? Confine it to only Winooski Falls Park until it is enrolled in a training course acceptable to our town health officer and require them to show proof of enrollment and training within 60 days. So moved. Second. Motion by Mike, second by Hal. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. 
Well, thank you for the attention and time you've all given to this matter. Um, this is the end of the Board of Health meeting, uh, the end of the agenda. So may I have a motion to adjourn? So move. Second. second. Motion by Mike, second by Jim. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. I feel thank good you. about my community with you guys running it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for letting us know. Okay, so we are, it is now 6.45 p.m. I am going to call to order this meeting of the regular meeting of the Winooski City Council. Um, the first item up is, uh, I need to unpromote Heidi as well, and I'm having trouble. Thank you. The first item on our agenda is agenda review. I actually wanted to propose adding an item. So staff wanted to discuss with us the schedule of our August meeting and or adding a second meeting. Would y'all be in favor of adding that to the end of our agenda discussion of August meetings? Can I have a, if, if so, if someone is in favor, can I have a motion to make this addition to the agenda? So moved. Second. Motion by Bryn, second by Hal. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries, thank you. So we will have an item F about our August meeting schedule. Uh, with that, we are at public comment. So this is a chance for members of the public who wish to speak about a topic that is not included in the agenda already. Um, if you are here for an agenda item, please hold until that time. Um, if you, if there is any member of the public that wishes to speak right now, um, please indicate with the raised hand or by using the chat to let us know. All right, uh, moving to our consent agenda, we have our minutes of June 26 and the warrant from 630 and 719 and the warrant for period 613 to 710. Um, Mike, you were missing at that meeting, right? I was, so I'm saying myself. Okay. Are there any questions or concerns about the consent agenda? Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Before you do that, I just do need to, for transparency's sake and in accordance with our purchasing policy, note that one of the checks was issued as an emergency payment to obtain housing for the family displaced by the fire. So that check has already been issued and given to the vendor to get housing for those people. Um, but that is the only check that has already been given out without council approval. Thank you, Angela. Extenuating circumstances. Um, did I have a motion to approve? I moved. Second. Motion by Jim, second by Bryn. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And those abstaining? Aye. All right, motion carries, thank you. So we are on to council reports. Uh, Hal, can I start with you? Sure, um, I have one item to report. Um, uh, the Safe uh, Healthy Connected People Commission is in the process of um, recruiting um, two commissioners and one um, alternate commissioner. Uh, we had interviews last week. We interviewed three individuals and uh, later this week there will be recommendations and then they'll be brought for to our next council meeting for approval. And that's all I have. Thanks, Hal. Jim. Sure. Thank you. Uh, the Housing Commission was unable to meet last time due to a lack of quorum, um, but we are uh, fortunate to have three applicants uh, going through interviews this week uh, to fill vacant seats on the commission. So I'm looking forward to participating and bring those recommendations back to council in the near future. Thank you. Mike. Thank you. I have nothing to report. Thanks. Bryn. The Municipal Infrastructure Committee did not meet this month. They have a meeting scheduled for August 4th. So looking forward to that. Um, and that's all I have to report. Thanks. Uh, finance also couldn't meet for lack of quorum often happens in July. Uh, and we also have three candidates that we are in the process of interviewing right now. Um, also have been doing, city manager search committee has been interviewing candidates for the city manager role. Um, 
We are, we will complete five interviews as of later this week with the intent to bring recommendations to the council at their August meeting about finalists, which we will then interview um, and then conduct a public interview as well. So there'll be more information on that, that process when those recommendations are shared in August. Um, Planning Commission did meet, continuing form-based code review. Um, nothing new or big to report there. And since our last meeting, also just wanted to mention um, the pride flag raising event that we had on June 28th. Uh, thank you, Bryn, for your contributions there and staff for, for facilitating that. Um, also had our other state rep, um, Taylor Small present for that event. First time we have done that in Winnie Street. That is it for council updates then. So let's move on to city updates. Great, thanks. Um, yep, I can go first. I only have three quick things for everyone. So first item, the um, as you all probably heard last week, we had a pretty major fire in Winooski at 62 Weaver Street, right across from City Hall. So just want to give some gratitude to uh, Chief Audi and his team. They did an amazing job. Um, also, I want to kind of give credit to St. Mike's and Colchester, Burlington, Essex, and VTang. Um, they were all there to support us, so um, that's much appreciated. Um, also, you know, our team, uh, Yaz, Red Cross, did a, an amazing job of helping out that family that was unfortunately displaced. And um, as Angela mentioned, you know, they worked really hard to find housing and, and support those Winooski uh, residents. So thanks to everyone who was involved with that. Uh, second item is uh, just an update on the VTrans project that's going on in the circulator. So they've started the next phase of work, which is um, a little bit longer duration. So they're doing joint repair work, um, which will take a couple weeks, it sounds like. Um, that's gonna be a little bit more disruptive, unfortunately, for folks that are down there. So a little bit noisier, there's gonna be you know, lights on during the evening, um, but they're gonna try to get out of there as soon as possible. Um, their schedule is, uh, I think, Thursday to Sunday, 7 p.m. to 6 a.m. So they're trying to um, you know, work around businesses, work around traffic, but it's still gonna be, unfortunately, a disruption for folks for, uh, for a little bit. Um, and then the last just kind of update is at one of the previous council meetings, um, you all approved a noise monitoring agreement. So um, that's Burlington Airport is gonna be bringing in some uh, microphone equipment to do noise level readings here at City Hall. So they're scheduled to install that equipment on Thursday right now, they're targeting. So um, I imagine shortly after that we'll be you know, putting out um, information on where you can find that data and how to access it through a, a public portal. So more to come on that. And that's all I have. Hi everyone. Um, I don't have too many updates because I've been out of the office, but I did want to thank the team for some really great teamwork around some of those challenging situations that happened over the past couple of weeks. Um, and I'm also excited to start the next stage of the process for city manager interviews and the council can keep an eye out for scheduling emails from me coming over the next week or so. So looking forward to that. Thank you. And welcome back. So we will move to our regular items, starting with item A, which is on for approval, a Manso Street block party, which Heather will introduce. Yep, and I have Keith Doherty. Oh, someone has already brought Keith in um, to represent the event. So we've received an event, an event permit application for a combination Manso and High Street block party on Saturday, July 31st from 4 to 7 p.m. So this is a really um, the type of event that we've been trying to encourage in our community, and it's a very light lift for city staff. So really, we just need to shut down the road um, with a blockade, and one half of it is already shut. So the request is really to put up a barrier um, blocking off the other end of the street. 
Um, and the event should probably be about 30 to 40 people, a potluck um, just for the neighbors. No alcohol will be served. So I think this is a pretty straightforward one and this will be the first ever. So I have Keith here to answer any questions you may have about what they intend for the event. Um, staff recommends approving this event permit. Thank you. Are there any questions from council? Great, and yeah, excited to see another neighborhood um, stepping up to, to do this kind of event. So thank you, Keith, and to you and your neighbors for, for organizing. Do I have a motion to approve? So move. Second. Motion by Mike, second by Jim. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion carries. Christine, Nancy's I do think Keith was trying to say something. Oh, sure, Keith, feel awesome. free. You did. Well, I'm happy to say it now. Uh, you've already approved it, but um, thank you very much. I mean, I moved here last summer and I've been meeting some of the neighbors just in passing. And I've always wanted to, you know, have a block party. This will be my first time hosting one. And I'm, uh, I'm just, yeah, I'm really excited now that we're going to be able to do this. Glad that you're taking the initiative. Someone's got to do it. <laughs> All right. So Manso Street block party will occur. Um, moving on to item B, this is a... This is on for discussion or approval. Uh, reserve fund request for hybrid meeting technology, which Angela will introduce. I mean, I can, but uh, John Rauscher prepared the memo and has done a lot of the legwork on this. Um, we <laughs> were approached that by- like, That sounds like you want me to do it, Angela. Well, I don't- <laughs> Um, we were approached by Channel 17 about installing hybrid meeting technology in the council chambers that would allow Zoom meetings to be held there, making the chambers basically a Zoom box on the, um, the webinar. Um, they gave us a quote of just under $8,000 for all of the components that they would install. Um, we've passed this by SimQuest for their review of the technology. They think it's a, a great system and didn't see any risks with our current setup. Um, and this is a potential use of ARPA funds, but is not necessarily something that we would have to use ARPA funds for given the amount of reserves that we have. Um, if we identify other uses of those funds. Yeah, and we have Megan O'Rourke here from um, Town Meeting TV to answer any questions about the equipment or how other municipalities are using it. Um, in, the, in the package that you all have, I put in some FAQs and it's mostly questions I've been asking them um, about the system, just so we kind of understand how it's being used. I think the thought is, um, you know, the equipment would be, just to give a brief overview, the equipment would be operated by Town Meeting TV. Um, we would still run Zoom meetings like we do now, um, where staff administers those. It really just enhances sort of the experience for the remote users and gives better communication for the folks that are um, live in attendance. So, and I think what the proposal would be is, um, we would just be using these for council meetings to start, um, there is a potential to use it for commission meetings and other meetings, um, but it, it's, you know, they it require some training and it might be a little bit tricky to have like a staff person trying to run equipment and Zoom meetings and, and whatnot. So I think really it's for um, you know, the larger council meeting discussions is what we're looking to use it for. So yeah, if you have any questions, Megan is, is here and um, yeah. Uh, that's it. Thanks, Angela and John. Yeah, I'm happy to, yeah. yeah. Hi. Hello. Welcome. I'm happy to answer any questions that folks have. We've been we've been installing these. It's been in Williston was our pilot, um, and so we're we're they they've allowed us to um, test out the systems on them. We're going to install a three camera system. Um, this week in Burlington. Um, I think maybe the quote that we gave you was a two camera system. We're gonna start with a single camera system and maybe a, so the quote may be, that may be the um, up to, but not over, um, could be how you're looking at that approval. 
And so it's uh, just to be clear, it sounds like operationally, it's not going to change what any of us are doing, but it will add uh, a better experience for Zoom attendees when we are all back in chambers. Yeah. And I think, you know, as for those who don't understand Tell Meeting Television's relationship, we have a board of trustees. You are rep represented by Kevin Lumpkin on the trustees from Winooski. You know, I consider this uh, public, you know, we're a public trust. We shepherd public resources. And what we do is um, agreed upon by the trustees. We cover certain meetings um, based on your subscriber base. Um, we are at the place where, you know, we're reviewing those contracts. So we have a contract and we cover, I think it's three meetings in Winooski a month, plus some events. And we also do, you know, for example, the, the Winoo world in the world of Winooski show. So we do other shows trying to use these resources to connect community members. One of the cool things, once you have cameras installed, is we can consider to, we can we can begin to think of this as a, um, a decentralized community television station resource. <laughs> so I, I I sort of got excited about the fact that you can have your own community TV station in um, City Hall and maybe this is not a selling point. I don't know. Maybe I'm you know there are other also you know other entities that have meetings such as CSWD um, that we could support to also do hybrid meetings and or you know maybe other other folks that you know we are already covering those meetings um, and we are working out a memorandum of understanding with the city of Burlington that we're going to base um, this on so you know, you owning the equipment, but us running it means a change to how we've done business. So it's going to be kind of requiring some imagination and creative thinking. And um, we're going to work with the trustees to do that. We want to be a technical resource for you to be able to help you do this work and um, and keep public participation fun and interesting um, I don't know, fun, maybe that's the wrong word, but, um, you could, you, you, I think, yeah, talking, <laughs> lots of talking. So if you have any questions on that, I'm happy to answer it. I, I can go all geek on you if you want. I have one question and that's if you have costed out like the equipment replacement and maintenance cycle and cost. Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming this is going to be a three-year um, initial cost. What we're going to do beyond that, you know, how often we're going to have to replace these cameras, I, I don't know, honestly. These are a, an entirely new breed of camera. They're called PTZ. They're point tilt zoom. I think the technology is going to change. I mean, I don't know if any of you have had the opportunity to work with the OWL for example, a lot of boards were like, oh, I'm going to buy this owl because it automatically follows people around. And But the technology is not quite there yet. So we're hoping to help move through the hurdle of, of this hybrid world and, and lift. And, and so it can't. So the, the long and short of it, Christine, is that I'm thinking of it as a three year cycle at this point. Um, okay. That's helpful. Yep. Do other counselors have questions? Jim? Um, so I'm excited to see this moving forward and the idea of these uh, remote meetings becoming permanently accessible. Um, so very excited to see this. And the one question I had is um, what level of, uh, and maybe this is kind of baked into the previous answers, but I imagine that if it's remotely produced and the remote production link connection goes down how much disruption do we expect in the room as someone tries to figure out how to take over manually on site? Or is that even an issue? Right, like Zoom could still function, we could still be having a meeting, but the ability of channel 17 to control this equipment from Burlington may, may break. Is that a concern or is that something that we, with a little bit of training a staff, can, a staff person can jump in and start doing that um, remote production for you on site? 
So we, we are not going to be remote. Uh, we are designing the system so that it could be run in a remote way. So recognizing this new world where, you know, who knows, there may be a system where you want to have four people in person. They have to be there. The rest of the people have to be at home. And you don't want a field producer walking in the door because we have, you know, a virus. I don't know. So we're right now we're going to continue to send our field producers. We like, we want them in the room with you. We think you want them in the room with you. They're going to be there on site to answer questions. So while it be, it's able to be like our technical person um, beams in during this testing period um, and is there virtually, we're going to have a real person in the room with you for the foreseeable future. Great. Thank you. Yep. Rin? Uh, thanks. Um, I am excited to start talking about hybrid. Um, I'm curious, do you have a sense for what the legislature is doing um, for their hybrid options? Um, I know that they put out a, a request for proposals and, you know, they're looking for folks to weigh in on it. I'm not sure where it's at at this point. Um, I think, you know, there are a couple of different things. There's the technical side of this. Then there's the open meeting law side of it. And then there's the, you know, what really builds community side of it. And I think you've all had those different experiences and we're going to continue to work through that. We want to be there right now to support the technical side and the open government side. So, you know, Town Meeting Television's mission is to open the doors of democracy. So we're there to, you know, to help with transparency, with archiving, with airing and live streaming your meetings. Um, and we're going to use technology to do that. Um, it's a kind of shifting, I mean, I, I don't, you know, I don't mean to be, it, it, there's a lot going on with it. So, you know, like, for example, in our, in the live stream of this meeting tonight, we have our field, we have our producer, Kevin Harms is here recording this meeting and live streaming it. And there's a title underneath you all that says what, what we're talking about right now that you don't see in the zoom meeting, but but maybe that's a possibility that we want to bring in in the future and add the functionality so that if people are in the Zoom, they also know what are these people talking about <laughs> and you, rather than just on the live stream. Um, so again, I'm not answering directly your question, but except that it's a we're all going to be learning this together as we go along. I do have another question if that's um, sure. I'm, I'm also curious. So. I'm thinking about uses and um, there are a number, any number of projects and um, topics coming up that are going to need stakeholder community input. Um, and I'm imagining City Hall might not be large enough in some cases. Um, I know with some of the planning meetings that, that they've been held at the O'Brien Center, can the equipment be moved to accommodate such meetings? Oh, interesting. So we have um, we have what we are considering maybe a portable system that we're going to work with with municipalities on, um, and that would be some sort of version of this that, you know, basically it's really what we're talking about is a laptop and a glorified webcam run by a person who is running, you know, who's like zooming in on who's speaking, and it's high quality and high quality audio. And then how you choose as a municipality to interact with that becomes, um, the, you know, that's the other piece that, we, you know, we can help you. But, you know, right now, for example, I as a participant in the webinar, I can't see anybody else in the room here, right? I might be more in encouraged or want to be part of this if I could see my fellow um, Winus Winusconians. <laughs> um, and, but you, you have to decide what you have the capacity to manage in terms of that. Um, so, so yeah, we can, we can move systems around and we have systems that we can bring portable systems to do this with folks. 
And I think that's a, a good consideration, again, back to that we contract for three meetings a month. And for a long time, we were using the third meeting on planning commission because of the master plan work. But huh. is that really our priority going forward? It probably isn't. There's probably, you know, that third meeting could be some other public engagement events. <laughs> or it may be that we, we work with the trustees to come up with a new contract agreement and um, a more friendly price point to allow you all to hire us more often to do other community events as well. Um, so that's also part of it is, is um, you know, maybe that you say, well, we wanna cover more stuff or we want more meetings archived and aired. Um, so, and, you know, part of this is teaching your staff how to use this gear, just like, just like community members can come now to Town Meeting TV and borrow equipment and make their own programs. And they do that sometimes, you know, that's how we started filming the Burlington Police Commission is we had a, a citizen who for a year recorded the Burlington Police Commission meetings until we raised enough money through fundraising to support that um, in a different way. So, you know, that's, that happens in, in what we do. And if you have the equipment in your, you're gonna own this equipment According to the agreement, we're gonna we're gonna use this equipment. We're gonna teach people how to run it. We're gonna we're gonna use it for the meetings. But your staff will also know how to use this eventually. Thanks, and I do want to add for council. You know, we did kind of hybrid our strategy priority session. It was a little bit challenging, um, <laughs> and yeah. Um, Eric also tried with the DRB meeting. It didn't go great, but you know we're just going to have to keep navigating it. I am happy to experiment with my finance commission meeting next month and you know try to work these kinks out. Um, Hal, um, thank you, Mary. I, I just think this is a, a great way going forward, and you know I'm on the joint legislative uh, management committee. And we're definitely going hybrid when we come back in uh, January. And because we have so many moving parts and committee rooms and so forth, you know, we're going to have to hire an additional staff person uh, mm -hmm. who has a, a, a real expertise around video because um, you got to get it right if you're going to make it effective. So I, I'm glad we're going this route. Uh, any other questions or concerns from council? Do I hear a mood, uh, Bryn? I am just uh, reluctant over the price point, and it sounds like there's still opportunity to learn a little bit more from other municipal experiences where this is being installed. So I personally don't feel comfortable voting to approve this tonight. Um, how do others feel? Does someone want to make a motion? Do we want more discussion? Do we want to bring this back at our next meeting? So what's the motion, Mayor? Uh, if, if you want to move forward, then just a motion to approve this reserve fund request. So moved. Okay. So there's a motion by Hal, second by Jim. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Aye from Mike. Those opposed? I am opposed. So the motion carries. Thank you. I'm gonna we check will... my audio. Can you guys hear me? We can now, yeah. I'm having some troubles here. <laughs> um thank you, Megan, for working. Yeah, on this. and so yeah, so it would be great to if John will let us know what the timing is on this, because we are quite eager to make sure that you are ready, um, that we are able to have this up and running and ready to support you when you're ready to go back in. Because it's we think it's really important that once you do start going hybrid, that that system works for the community well, and they don't have as they don't go in with a lot of bumps. And it's a little bit harder to go 
this other way than to go fully remote. So we just need to hear from you when you're ready to be meeting back in person so that we can get that planned, okay? We will be in touch. Okay, great, thanks so much. Thank you. So moving on to item C, this is up for approval. This is the 2021-22 strategies and priorities. Um, you know, in June, we reviewed these staff recommendations at our Saturday session. Then we gave staff some time to look at that and come back to us, you know, make sure this is viable, let us know if there's any conflicts or additional resource needs, et cetera. And so we have an update here that Ray has put together. Ray, do you want to introduce? Let us know what, what we're looking at. Sure. So, um, you know, quite honestly, not a lot has changed from what you worked with on the 26th of June. Um, you know, the primary add to this, which we discussed that day, was the addition of all resident voting um, and the need to figure out a game plan for implementation there, because um, that had not been part of the draft prior to that day. Um, and then also just added, you know, more honestly for staff's guidelines, I think just the uh, the votes, if you will, that folks took that day of the various items just to help us kind of get a sense from a prioritization standpoint of where council was looking at various items in the lists. So in addition to kind of those updates, um, also proposed here a, a quarterly cycle for updates to council on the four um, pillars of the master plan. Um, that was truthfully uh, a copy from the last normal year of this that we had. Um, and Heather, you can owe me a cookie because uh, it looks like housing um, only has three and everybody else has four. But um, I also know we've had quite a bit of discussion recently about housing issues um, with the housing trust fund. So felt like that was probably an okay, um, okay one to skip given that we only have the one July meeting. So beyond that, not a lot else to report. Um, and again, this reflects what you all looked at on the 26th. Thanks, Ray. Um, I'll just say that's kind of exciting to hear that, you know, upon further consideration, y'all did not find the need to, to make changes or flag any big concerns here. Um, so this, should we approve this as our priorities moving forward? Um, staff and council liaisons will work with commission chairs to also integrate work plans for commissions. Um, and we will be referencing this throughout the course of the next year. Are there questions from council? Bryn. I was curious, does this include Mike's responses? So Mike had had a chance to review in advance and Mike add on as needed, um, but he was generally okay with the recommendations um, that were put forth and so didn't make any new additions or changes. Okay, great. No, the, the list is a lot of familiar work that we've been, that's been ongoing anyway, and it's, it, has, it hasn't really shifted any. It seems like the, the priorities are all the, in the same line as the last retreat, retreat we had. So I was, Pretty impressed with what you guys came up with, and I didn't really have anything to add to it. Yeah, and Mike, at the at the session, um, we didn't. Uh, none of us really made significant changes here, and discussed that being, you know, the result of having a really strong master plan that we are all invested in and working towards, and having a shared vision. So staff are bringing forward what we are discussing as well, and what our community is prioritizing. Uh, Hal. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So uh, a question for Ray, just a clarifying question. So in some of these activities, the proposed activities, there's an asterisk or two or three behind each. Yeah. What, what's, what's, the, what's the significance of that? So those um, at the um, retreat, uh, each, and I'm not going to remember the number now off the top of my head, but each counselor that was there got um, little sticky dots to put uh, okay. and, and okay. really what that's just helping is within those those buckets for staff to get a sense of what are the sort of highest priority items within each of those areas. Um, they're it. obviously priority items, but when push comes to shove and we need to prioritize work, it's just a little bit of a guidepost for us to say, 
these are the areas that really jump to the top of the list for council. Great. So, so thank you. Each asterisk was a was a dot. Got it. Great. So just piggybacking on the clarification, um, I've you know reviewed what the council did last year, um, and then where they're at, where there are asterisks for items that are recommended. Um, how does that fall in line with the prioritization? Um, that's a good question. So like for housing, there, there, there's one item recommended, it's got two asterisks, there's another item that's a new idea that has one asterisk. So just what's the, so I understand how we're all making sure that I'm understanding the intent and the interpretation the same way as everybody else. Mm -hmm. So can I jump in, I, Ray, because I would say, let's tell staff how we feel about that now, right? Because this is our role is to set these priorities. Um, the way I would view this is we have our must do's. We have the starred items within must do. And if we get to recommended, we have our starred items there um, and so forth. Is that, do folks feel good about that? Heather, you wanna jump in? I, I just wanted to point out um, one piece that must do's and recommendeds um, we discussed as you know one thing the new ideas were discussed specifically with new resources um, allocated. So I think that's part of this conversation as well, if some of those new ideas come in. Yeah, and for the purpose of my interpretation, it was really just an example. Does that sound good? Does that sound right to everyone else though? The way to approach this is must do, star, recommended is still after must do's. See some head nods. Feels like that makes sense to me. Okay. It's a good question though, because I see those now in the, the light areas. Thank you. Um, any, any other thoughts, questions here? All right. So, can I have a motion to approve the 2021-22 Strategies and Priorities Plan? So moved. Second. Motion by Hal, second by Jim. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. And thanks again for a lot of work has gone into this. Thank I'm you. excited Paul. to move forward with this again. Um, we are on to item D. This is just on for discussion. It is a project update for Main Street. Yes, thank you. Um, so this is roughly quarterly. I think we're a little beyond our quarterly update, but we've been trying to come to the council to give, um, you know, these kind of quarterly updates on the project, just so, so you all know where where we're at status-wise, um, especially looking at schedule and cost estimates work to date and you know things that that are upcoming so uh, as a general overview for the main street project um, there's really no council actions tonight uh, I would say that so the project is kind of chugged along in the background so this is this is the phase of the project where the bulk of the design is done um, we're not quite into bid phase yet um, but there's a lot of administrative work that's happening in the background by the consultant team, by our staff. So um, it's there's no new like really exciting things going on. It's a lot of um, getting report approvals and having discussions with utilities and other folks, um, and then we draw a line that's 10 feet away, you know, from another line. So it may not look like there's a ton going on, but um, there's a lot of that administrative work that's happening in the background. So just to kind of give a high level, um, we're still in 90% design phase. We'll be in 90% design phase until we get through the right away process. So right away process is where we go to each property owner along the corridor and um, request construction easements um, for excavation work in the street and any permanent easements where we'll need to land a uh, like an electrical transformer or something that's going to be on their property property permanently. So that's really where 
our main focus is right now is is reaching out to all those property owners um, having discussions one-on-one -on -one with a lot of them um, explaining the project um, and and soliciting for those temporary construction easements so that that process is going pretty well um, we've had we've been able to reach out to a lot of folks and um, we haven't run into any major concerns from property owners um, we haven't gotten into the permanent easement phase yet because that requires some more um, coordination with GMP because it's really their equipment and it's their easement but the construction easement work we've been doing um, has been going pretty well um, cost wise no significant updates there we're still looking at roughly 20 million dollar project um, whole project that's engineering uh, construction um, any 10% uh, uh, contingency is in there so well below that 23 million bond vote uh, the 20 million does not include the four points uh, roughly 4.6 million in grants as well so way below the 23 million bond vote threshold so and um, schedule wise we're still on target to um, start construction uh, looking at June, early June next year. So we're still kind of on target there, assuming right away keeps going well for us. So um, we did provide in the packet sort of an updated um, summary Gantt chart that, that we've been doing in house to just kind of keep tabs on how we're doing task wise. Um, so yeah. a quick, quick yeah, clarification. Yep. So you're saying it's about 20 million cost but we also have five million in grants so the actual cost coming out of tax revenue is about 15. correct yeah okay or yeah. And, and it will, yeah it's it's right it's it's general fund sewer fund and water fund so it's you know that's broken up in there okay thank you yep and then um just to highlight the major work that's going on right now i mentioned right away gmp coordination is a big task for us right now we're having a lot of um you know back and forth the drawings with with those folks one of the big pieces that we got recently is um, a gmp cost estimate that is not reflected in this current estimate um, it is significantly lower than what we are estimating right now so that's great news but we just want to go through it with in a little more detail before we really incorporate it into our project estimate um, the other big task that that we um, actually is the next agenda item, uh, the raise grant. So we updated the narrative and um, that full raise grant package, which is a US DOT federal grant, very competitive, it's, it's nationwide. Um, it includes benefit cost analysis, includes um, you know, some, some background on the benefit cost. So we have to look at crash data and uh, a whole bunch of um, technical details that go into that analysis. Um, we provide the narrative so you can kind of see what's what's in that, but that was a big lift um, and, you know, major kudos to our city engineer, Ryan Lambert, who really kind of spearheaded that and updated that grant application. Um, and I think we're, we're going to be pretty competitive. Um, this is our third submission for that grant. Um, the last time we submitted, we we received a debrief from USDOT, and according to them, we made it to the last phase of the review process, which um, that means it lands on the Secretary of Transportation's desk for sort of final project selection. So, you know, we think we're really competitive given that the, you know, the, the grant has, the grant requirements changed a little bit, and I would say in our favor, because now they're looking at, um, you know, how does equity play into this project um, and how do you know looking at the you know sort of the economic development piece of the project so uh, our main street project hits a couple of those points it's not just you know a bridge project that some of these folks or heavy highway project that some of these other um, applications are, are using so you know, fingers crossed, we will hear back in September on that grant application. Um, I, I know I'm getting ahead of myself, but that's a $7.2 million grant request for, for that application. Um, but yeah, other than that, um, the other just 
smaller piece that I'll flag that, that might be of interest is we are also coordinating with CCRPC right now. Um, they're using some what's called Bluetooth monitoring tech for um, looking at traffic data and speeds. We're, we're looking at incorporating what's called um, smart work space, I believe it's called, into our project specifications. So basically what that would do is create some thresholds for the contractor to keep traffic moving during construction. So we would be live monitoring what the traffic flows look like during construction based on their traffic impact or their traffic control plan. And in our specifications, we would say, okay, you have to maintain X number of cars through this area um, per day. And if they don't meet that specification, you know, they have to make changes to the traffic control plan. So um, I, it's something we're really interested in pursuing because I mean, I think that's one of our biggest concerns on during the traffic control piece of the construction project uh, during the morning and evenings is how, how are we gonna keep vehicles flowing and not backing up on the corridor? Um, so more to come on that, I'm sure, but uh, we're exploring that further with CCRPC. So with that, if there are any questions. Um... Great. Uh, thanks for including the Gantt chart. I think that's super helpful for me to see what the um, phases are and kind of where you are with your estimated timeline. Um, I was noticing that it looks like project um, initiation might not start until June, mid-June next year. Um, how realistic is that? I, I guess, is it more likely to get pushed back or is there any way to move it like earlier so that we can get a full construction season in? Yeah, I mean, I will say the, the estimate, the, the, the schedule right now is, honestly, it's probably more for us internally to kind of keep tabs and push the consultant. So there's, there's room either way to either try to you know, speed up on a couple of critical path items or, you know, our, our goal is at least be in construction by June. And then one other question, um, it's the, at least the memo that was included so that you were, there are some delays with getting the easements, but how's the, how is that going? Yeah, it, it, it's definitely picked up. I mean, some of the delays were us finding some time, <laughs> frankly, to, to start reaching out to owners. So what we ended up doing was um, we had some budget within our current proposal with our consultant VHB, and we, uh, we tasked them to bring on a staff person who has experience with easements to start helping us, supporting us with getting some of those easements and reaching out. So we'll make first contact, for example, on easements, um, but then VHB will help us reaching back out to those owners explaining any technical questions or just following up and tracking where we are. So that's that's been sort of a lifesaver on the schedule side. John, are you encountering, can, we know construction costs are insane this year. Is that impacting the materials required for this kind of project? It might. Yeah, it's it's really hard to gauge right now because the fluctuations seem to be, I mean, just that they're, you know, you look at a forecast for materials and they say two by fours are going to go down, lumber is going to go down or pipe material is going to go down or it's going to go up. So we're really hesitant to like, to really adjust those numbers until the market sort of settles out. Um, so once we get a little bit closer to bid time, that's when we'll really start looking at where we think the market's gonna be for materials and labor um, and and really take a look to see if, if we need to trim any scope um, in order to to get us back in budget. But as I mentioned, right now we're we're in really good shape budget wise, at least on the estimate. We you know, we're well under the threshold and hopefully if we grab a couple more grants, we you know, we'll be way, way under <laughs> the threshold. If there was continuing 
um, cost fluctuations. And we thought, don't start now, wait a year or something. Is that possible? I know there's a cap on some of this grant funding in the timeline. Yeah, USDA is the only funder we would probably have to, well, USDA and the Northern Border Regional folks. Um, but they, you know, they're typically flexible to open to looking at, you know, extending if if we see um, if we see some movement. Yeah, bike pad. We we we're working with them. Heather mentioned bike pad in the chat. V trans. Um, we've been working with them right along. They're they've been pretty flexible with us, so I, I don't think they would have any concerns. But yeah, it would just be a matter of reaching out to those folks if if the market looked a little crazy for pricing. And isn't there a cap with the bond as well? Some sort of time frame to take that money out and spend it? I'm not sure on that one. Angela, do you have any idea? That isn't information that I have at my fingertips. Yeah. Okay. Some look at I'll it. follow up separately. This is a just in case scenario anyway, so. Um, Grin. Um, but piggybacking on that thought, uh, Mayor, I am wondering, so I think in previous meetings it was said that ARCA funds are not available for this project, but I'm wondering if there is inflation for supplies and for the equipment, if that might be an influencer to have funds be released. I don't know if that, if you caught any of that with the echo. Yeah, can you? I think it was looking at ARPA funds potentially for to cover some of the inflation. Is that it? Sorry. Exactly. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I, it's something we can, Angela and I can can review for sure. Yep. I mean, there's also potentially, you know, infrastructure funding coming down from the feds. So there's, it looks like we're potentially going out to bid at a really opportunistic time, maybe if if the feds can um, can push some money to local municipalities. So we will see. Other questions about the project update before we move on to the race grant? I will say for, uh, actually, I'll wait, is this technically about the grant? Uh, so we will move on from item D and on to item E, which is up for approval. This is the raise grant application for Main Street, which John, you've sort of already introduced. Anything you want to add? Uh, the only thing I'll add is we have reached out to all the delegation folks, um, just so that if there's any advocacy that they can do on their end, um, just trying to hit all angles if possible. Um, we did get uh, letters, letters of support from RPC and downtown Winooski and the school. So, um, yeah, other than that, you know, um, fingers crossed, uh, we should hear back this fall. So, I did just want to say for any potential viewers, um, that narrative that you had to put together for this grant is actually really informative about what is included in this project and, and the why behind it. Um, you know, may, this Main Street project came when I first joined council and I, I was not sold on the project at the time and have learned more about it over time and some of the benefits that this work will bring to us. So I, I think it's interesting if someone's interested in learning more about the project. I think it also goes to show how much work it takes to apply for grant money. Um, you know, we often hear like, can't you just get more grant funding? And it does take a lot of leg work, time and effort to do that. Um, and also just want to recognize as you shared in our last item that we've already obtained almost a quarter of the cost of this project in grant funding. And so really appreciative of staff continuing to seek out these other sources of revenue. Um, I did notice though, this application is for the streetscape only, right? And I thought in years past, we applied for the full project. So I wondered if you could talk about that. Yeah, we, we applied for streetscape only just because um, 
you know, that's where we need the most support on the funding. And what we heard back from USDOT folks is, you know, that seven to 10 million ish range would be more competitive for us. Um, we do have, uh, you know, on the water resources side, we are, we have a commitment from USDA with some significant grants funding um, to cover that. So, and the challenge with that USDA funding is any other funding that flows into water resources just reduces the amount of grant on the USDA side. So, it, you know, we got a pretty good deal with the USDA and a, a pretty healthy grant. So we would, we would basically need someone to top USDA's offer in order us to move to, you know, another, another funding option. That's helpful to understand. Thank you. Um, so I think this was in your memo, but for council context, we've applied for this three times before, at least twice. Yeah. So are there any questions or concerns about this grant application? Bryn. Uh, question, not a concern. Uh, I was curious if we know if there are any other municipalities in Vermont that are applying for this. I know a municipal official in South Burlington that mentioned they would be applying for it. Um, she may or may have not worked here previously. Uh, and uh, I know RPC is putting in for a planning grant, but that doesn't compete against us. Um, the state usually puts in for some kind of heavy highway or bridge, but I haven't I haven't heard of them putting anything in. So, yeah, South Burlington's the only one I've heard of. But we're our projects way better than theirs, so it'll be fine. Yeah, I the reason why I asked is because if it sounds like we've got letters of support from the RPC, the school, um, if there would be help to have letters of support from our legislative uh, officials. Maybe Hal and his friends can put a letter in. Yeah, at this point, so I, I guess I should back up. We did submit the grant. <laughs> so we're coming after the fact, unfortunately, but um, I will see if there is. I mean, the delegation has even said that they'd be willing to, you know, potentially put in a, a letter of support. So if there's a mechanism to do some advocacy afterwards during the review um, that might be helpful so I'll, I'll check into it any other questions here all right so can i have a motion to approve the raise grant application so move. Second. Second. <laughs> okay motion by jim second by hal all those in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion carries, thank you. So we are on to item F, which was a question about our August meeting schedule. I don't know which staffer wants to introduce this because I can't remember the original concern. Yep, so I can introduce it. So the, the question was, um, I think in the last two years, maybe Angela, we've had one meeting up. No, get the head shake. Just uh, in 2019, there was only one August meeting. Got it. So um, I guess the question would be whether you all would like to have two meetings in August. I believe it's, I think Bad uh, Bennington Battle Day is in the mix there. So it's August 17th and August 3rd, or August 2nd would be the two August dates. And then I, I know the city manager search is kind of in the mix there too. So um, that is the question on how you want to set up next month. Yeah, so we're already scheduled to meet on the 2nd. We are not scheduled for the 17th. It, was there a warrant or some sort of approval that made us want to do the 17th? If you don't meet on the 17th, I will need to do an interim warrant. There's no way we can go from August 2nd until the first meeting in September without paying bills. Okay. So. Well, if I recall, the reason we had two meetings last year is because we were approving our charter, or we were having our public hearing on the charter changes in August. So that was one of the meetings that caused us to have a second one in August. 
Yeah, because we were only trying to have one again. So we, I had talked to Steph about this and potentially not having August 2nd and doing the 17th instead because it's better for the, the warrant schedule. But then the city manager, search committee, I don't really want to delay their recommendations even further. Like we're already kind of behind schedule. So I had considered maybe we do both, but we keep one of those meetings super light. Either like August 2nd is primarily just for the recommendations or the 17th is just for the warrant kind of, um, just to try to help ease the summer, summer scheduling. Um, Bryn, I see your hand. Um, just given the decision at the top of the meeting, um, it seemed like we wanted to give the dog owners multiple uh, meetings to be able to attend. I don't know if that really should factor into our decision or not. Is anyone, uh, Mike, go ahead. I will not be able to make August 17th. Okay. Is anyone else not able to do the 17th? I will do it, but I'll be on vacation and would prefer not to. Okay. So what if we add a meeting on the 17th? We keep that agenda very light. This is primarily for warrant approval. And if it is just Bryn, Hal, and I, that is a quorum and we are able to proceed if that's how it plays out. Hey, if, Angela. Just, oh, sorry. If, if it's just for warrant, we can do, we have in policy and procedure the um, interim warrants where three counselors can come and sign so that we can release checks and then you just reaffirm the approval at your next regular meeting. So if you're just having a meeting for the warrant, that's not necessary. TV, were you gonna add something? Yeah, just that the for our actual interviews for city manager candidates, those will need to be separate um, special meetings that will mm -hmm. need to go into executive session for. So if there is any, you know, those are also an opportunity for, um, you know, approving a warrant or doing any you know, small amount of extra business if we need to. And those will likely, you know, we won't, if we have three candidates, we likely won't schedule all of those for the same meeting. So they would need to be separate. That is a good note. Um, my other thought was that if for some reason we cannot get a recommendation ready by the second, we would have the 17th as a backup. Um, we could add a meeting for the 17th and then cancel it if we don't need it. Would folks be okay with doing that? I'm fine with it. Okay, so we we add an August 17th meeting. If we need it, we have it. If we don't need it, we cancel it and we can approve the warrant in one of these special meetings that we're having for interviews. Um, yeah, okay. Could I have a motion then to add a council meeting for August 17th? So moved. Second. Motion by Bryn, second by Hal. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. All right, motion carries, thank you. We'll add a meeting and hopefully we'll cancel it. Uh, this brings us to the end of tonight's agenda. Do I have a meeting to, I'm sorry, a motion to adjourn? So move. Second. Motion by Mike, second by Jim. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you, everyone.